know, interestingly enough, the legal part of it, and it, this is really a question of technology being allowed to completely override the existing legal boundaries, both domestically and internationally. Domestically first, United States has, a, has at least a law officially that you cannot take away life and liberty of an American citizen without due process of law. And the American position now, the establishment position is due process of law means the president has looked at it and said it's okay, or defense secretary has looked at it, or somebody has looked at it and said it's okay. It does not mean the judicial process. Now, don't you think it spends that this is a completely going back to medieval ages where you know, anybody can decide that you are your freedom of uh, life or liberty has no meaning? Well, uh, there are a couple of things I would say about that. One is, you know, sovereign is he who decides upon the exception. The ultimate test of sovereignty is to decide when the law does not apply. This is something that was formulated by a great jurist, first for the Weimar Republic, then for the Nazis. All right. In, in the United States has, from virtually its origins, defined itself as an exceptional state. A state which is exceptional among the committee of states. This constant notion of exceptions. Now you have come to a point where for the last 12 years there is a permanent state of exception in which the president's powers to to take the law and redefine it according to presidential decree, as it were, or just sheer exercise of power. You have come to that point. Uh, and yes, you, you did, now there is no judicial process. Um, uh, again, you know, the, these are things that have been happening step by step. Habeas corpus. Uh, Guantanamo Bay habeas corpus was finally set aside in this war on terror. Definition of torture, acceptance of torture. First you redefine and lots of kinds of torture are no longer torture. But then you take the next step and say that in order to save lives in the future, you are authorized to torture. So all of this paraphernalia of rights is being abrogated precisely at the time when countries are being bombed in the name of human rights. <laughs> precisely at the time when those rights are being abrogated by the, by the highest authorities of the United States between the Supreme Court of the United States and the President of the United States, one after the other. All the bases on which liberal democracies have supposedly based themselves. You know, the whole issue of the Westphalian state, the sovereignty of the state, as you have said, is now being redefined in the context of imperial sovereignty. Of course, this is the colonial sovereignty as we knew it earlier. Now it's become also something which is across board, <coughs> across the world. Otherwise, Westphalian state only applied to certain countries, but not to the colonial uh, colonized countries, because that, of course, were not recognized as entities which needed this kind of definition. But this destruction of the Westphalian state, the right to protect being converted into a right to attack, how do you see international law playing itself in the next 10, 15 years? Don't you think this is really something which is going to rebound soon, sooner rather than later? You see, the Westphalian state was really a historical process or uh, the conceptual basis for historical process. Uh, that was applied strictly to the Western states. Uh, did not apply to the colonial world. 
decolonization creates a, an immediate crisis for that historical usage of the Westphalian state where any number of states now arise which call themselves nation states, which are by definitions of that kind nation states. Um, and now you have to treat them the way you were formally supposed to treat each other. So the question now then comes, how do you abrogate the rights of sovereignty for this new type of nation state that has arisen outside the heartlands of advanced capital? You know, so, so part of it is actually reconstructing the basis of the colonial order without acquiring colonies. Yes, in, in that sense, the right to protect, the, philosophy, the legal the right to protect doctrine, which has now been also somehow accepted by the United Nations General Assembly, is being talked about as a new basis for intervention, is really a modification of the nation state to certain set of states which can intervene in others and others who are recipients of such intervention who do not have the right to protect their sovereignty. But the, the colonial powers always rule you in your own interest. Some of them call them its civilizing mission, some of them, uh, you know, there was different kinds of terminology, it was always in your interest. Uh, <clears throat> again, um, accepting it by the United Nations General Assembly you know, this is coercive acceptance. Um, which of these countries would really like to be the target of it? And great many of them know that they might be. Tomorrow the target. Tomorrow the target. And yet, the imperial center has the power to coerce. And, but this is also happening in another way. The nation state, I think, is being dissolved in a very particular way. And a new type of state is coming into being, not only in the backward capitalist countries, but also in the advanced zones, where the nation state is being dissolved and being replaced by a market state. Where the, look, I mean, the claim of the nation state was that it represented the people of that nation state to the rest of the world. And secondly, that it acted for the well-being of the people of that country. That was essentially two claims that the nation state made. Formally, that is it. Now what you have is that the only task left for the state is to represent the market forces, that is to say finance capital, to its inhabitants and make them obey the orders of the market regardless of their well-being. The well-being of the population no longer is. You know, yes, if you really look at that, today it's happening also in the heart of Europe, Greece. That, Spain, that's Scotland, exactly what I exactly. Meant. But if you really look at it before, then you would find this is also something which has been imposed to the IMF, particularly at the World Bank, to the Structural Adjustment Program, for instance, in Africa, as well as large parts of Asia and Latin America. Yeah, yeah. So we have the colonial model yeah, in terms yeah, of the market yeah. state but, re-emerging. But, you, but you, see, you see, my point is that now it is happening in the heartlands of capital itself. And this universalization of this is the gift that the collapse of social democracy has given us. Well, one could also argue, uh, Jazz, that this is a gift of collapse of socialism as Soviet Union. Oh, absolutely. And that that oh, has really led to... Oh, absolutely. Also. I actually divide um, uh, this history very quickly in three um, periods the history of law. There was a colonial period in which there was one law for the advanced capitalist countries and there was no law for the rest of the world. 
Then you have a period when the American uh, empire, you know, when the Americans uh, become the world leader of a, a single empire. And the great constraint on them was a systemic one which is the existence of the Soviet Union and the so Socialist Bloc generally, which imposed upon both sides certain norms and limits, constraints within which to work. The collapse of the Soviet Union takes away that system of constraints. So we are back to that is kind. That is the real fact. At the same time, just at the, uh, at the time when the Soviet Union was collapsing, social democracy succumbed completely to the neoliberal order. And it is the acceptance of neoliberalism by social democrats yeah. which creates a consensus. One could, you know, just one could discuss that some other day perhaps that social democracy was in fact the attempt by capital to protect the from socialism advancing further. And once socialism, socialist bloc collapses, social democracies, of course, it's position vis-a-vis -vis capital weakens much more. But that's really yeah, something yeah, we can have another, yeah, yeah. another date. But coming back today, what you're really saying is we have re-emergence of at least a colonial legal system officially sanctioned by the United States. It is a right to attack any country, anywhere in the world, and also by global finance capital. It, it can impose its policies on any country irrespective of wishes of the people of that country. So sovereign space currently is no longer on the agenda, the global agenda. My question really was, how long do you think this can sustain itself? That do you think this condition of illegal systems, if you will, internationally, as per international law is defined in international law and countries upgrading their own internal sovereignty, this can continue for long? I think it can continue for very long. Uh, it will it, depend entirely on the level of social and class struggles. Um, all, all of this that we are talking about is the most ferocious attack of capital on the peoples of the world, certainly since the 1930s, but since well before that. And it can succeed. As long as resistance does not yeah, come up. Yeah. That's really the crux. That's really the crisis. If the resistance does not come, come up, this kind of extra legal exercise of centralized power, of capital in which the states, even of the most advanced countries, can become mere agents of that, finance capital will continue. There is a barbaric uh, moment in which your politics is run entirely by money. Some countries of Europe are somewhat protected against that, but that is the trend. So it's really Money the, runs state directly. So really the issue right now is what is the kind of resistance that develops. That's right. That's thank, right. thank you, Ajaz. I think it's been a very interesting discussion and let's look at the resistance next time we meet. Indeed.